It is Monday, October the 14th, 2023. Good morning, 2024. We'll call it, it is 2024. Where did 2023 come from? <laughs> well, I guess slips can sometimes be infectious. I thought I was one that was usually guilty of such things. <laughs> of course, it's the 14th of October, 2024. Good morning and welcome to the Morning Brief. As Monday opens with strength, vigor, and resilience on this side of the divide. We hope we can infect you with some of those as well. Welcome to your perfect day starter. I am Bukola Koka. I'm Kaya Okikilu. I promise you we're in 2024. You don't need to <laughs> check your calendar. This is 2024. And um, I've been keeping up with dates uh, of late from last year, this year, and then the coming days. Maybe that's why I still have 2023 in my head. And mm -hmm. I just want to be the first person to tell you that Christmas is almost here. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I know for some people, it's mixed feelings. In less than 10 weeks, it'll be Christmas. You know, right? Yeah. And it looks like um, a lot of people are not sure what Christmas will be like. Right? And it's understandable. But first, I want you to just realize that Christmas is almost here. Whatever Christmas means to you, I really hope that you can uh, borrow some joy from the season and use it right now. Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are wondering, so what will Christmas look like? What will the price of petrol be on Christmas Day or around Christmas? That's what people are asking now. So it's no more about the celebration, but the factors that will make the celebration either enjoyable or otherwise. What will be the price of food items? And I really hope that governments at all levels, right, those who are meant to make policies that mm -hmm. will affect people, will not wait till then. Mm -hmm. Because Christmas is a big deal. In fact, festivities are usually a big deal holiday seasons uh, that's when people want to just relax and uh you know kick off their shoes and rest from the long year so i really hope mm -hmm. that we are planning for the future it's literally here but hey christmas is almost here and, uh, uh, and you know it's quite instructive Kyrie, to borrow some joy from that time yeah. you know and bring it back to the now you know and it's a defense you know to protect that space um, you know, from thinking about all of the possibilities, we hope, we certainly hope not that those negative possibilities will not come from Christmas time. But however, you know, uh, if they present themselves, we will still celebrate. And speaking of the possibilities, uh, of course, we got that conversation, which will be broadcasting at about 10 a.m. during our breakfast program business morning later today uh, with the group managing director of the NNPCL talking about how arbitrage and smuggling uh, have prevented the real uh, value of subsidy, uh, you know, uh, playing out. Uh, and we get that, you know, but uh, we, we have genuine questions. Uh, even now that the acclaimed subsidy has been removed, mm. of course, there are reports that indeed partial subsidy is still being paid. So um, is that still going on? Is, is arbitrage still going on? Is smuggling still going on? What is the consumption of petrol per day for Nigeria? Um, why, the, uh, uh, why is the negotiation between Dangote Refinery and the NNPCL, why is it still shrouded in secrecy? What advantage does that homegrown refinery bring to bear on Nigeria? When are we going to exit uh, the regime of petrol importation. Uh, I hope that, you know, um, um, the group managing director of the NNPCL will be answering those questions in that conversation today as well. If not, we will keep asking those questions. What's our, you know, production of crude oil barrel per day uh, currently? Um, what, uh, do we really have energy security? What's going to happen to the, you know, Port Harcourt refinery and the Kaduna refinery and the Wari refinery? The, the Port Harcourt refinery, by the way, has filled many deadlines for resumption of work. Uh, Mr. Mr. G, GMD. And the GCO. What, yeah, GCO. So um, what, what's happening to the promised energy security, um, you know, that you told Nigerians about? Uh, Nigerians are groaning beneath the weight of continuing increase in the pump price of petrol. And I, I don't see uh, the GCU queuing anywhere in any filling station uh, just to buy fuel. So these issues must be resolved in the interest of Nigeria. That sector is a critical sector and it requires intervention, just as it is done in other parts of the world. Well, but you know what? We're still going to give you a snippet 
uh, of that interview right here mm -hmm. on the show. So while you're waiting for the fuller package, we'll give you some of the things said about equalization. So I think the work now is to merge or unite the work being done on that end with the yearnings of Nigerians on this end. So it's just trying to find a, a meeting point because it looks like at this point they are parallel aligned. So We'll give you a snippet of that just in a few moments right here on the show. But let's give you a picture, a bigger picture of what we have for you today on the morning brief. Well, it's the new normal, really. Uh, but how normal does this feel for Nigerians and how well are they adjusting to this new normal? I think the big question will be what antidote then is available other than this bitter appeal of the rising costs of petrol. Well, we'll seek to bring answers to those questions on your mind. We'll take a listen to what the GCU of NNPCL is saying. And then, of course, we'll pick things up as they go. But that's not all. We hear from a member of the president's cabinet. What's the thinking in in-house that's in the cabinets generally, and particularly for the sector which has been described as our buried gold, or more appropriately, our buried steel? Yes, you'll be seeing who that person is on the show this morning. And uh, we'll take a break from oily issues and go to sports. One of the things that makes Nigerians happy uh, a healthy break from all of that uh, stress. The Super Eagles of Nigeria continue their run under interim coach Augustin Iguavon and the Mediterranean Knights are the latest to be put to the sword, at least for the first leg. Can this impressive run continue, particularly with the antiques of the Libyan authorities and team? So oh, we're going to be yes. having that conversation. We'll ask all those questions. Um, some of our colleagues will join us. And of course, as always, it promises to be an exciting conversation. Oh, yes. But we're keeping our eyes on what is trending as well. The Senate president trended this weekend. And it looks like he'll trend uh, for the coming hours or day or more. But we'll be giving you a context to that video which you've seen trending about the Senate president asking uh, people uh, to eat wherever they find food. There's a context to that video. In fact, there's a date to that video, but you have to stay with us right here on Channels mm -hmm. Television for that and so much more. Hashtag CTV Morning Brief. That's our hand of fellowship to you today. Yeah. Are so you ready? Send us your questions and your concerns. We're starting off with the top stories right now. So stay with us. The Morning Brief is on. The price of petrol remains one of the biggest stories in the country today, and the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, is asking President Bola Tinubu to instruct the NNPC Limited to reverse the recent increase in petrol prices pending the hearing and determination of a lawsuit filed in the Federal High Court Abuja, which challenges the legality of NNPC Limited's authority to raise petrol prices. Only last month, SERAP had initiated legal action against the President and the NNPC Limited due to what the group describes as as their failure to reverse what they deemed an unlawful increase in petrol prices. But commenting on the latest increment in an open letter signed by SERP's Deputy Director Kolawali Oluwadari, the organization said, the increase in petrol prices, while the federal high court case is pending, will undermine the ability of a court to do justice in the case, damage public confidence in the court, prejudice the outcome of the case, as well as impede the course of justice. Meanwhile, the group chief executive officer of the NNPC Limited, Mr. Mele Kiaru, says that cross-border smuggling and arbitrage have for several decades eroded the value that subsidy uh, was made to achieve. Providing more information on what President Bolatinabu's decision on subsidy removal meant, Mr. Kiaru says it brought about price parity and equalization, especially with cross-border prices of PMS. Mr. Kiaru, in an interview with journalists, also spoke on the progress made on combating crude oil thieves, gas development, infrastructure, and the future of energy in Nigeria. In the last uh, 40-something years, you know, PMS has always been subsidized. 
and subsidy is uh, creating arbitrage. That means there's a difference between price in one location lower than what it should be from with another location. The evacuation from the devil average 51 in recent times. And when Mr. President announced the removal of the subsidy in June, what it did is calibrated price. It came to market. There is no longer any value in anyone taking the product across the border. If you do, you are not going to make those profits that you do. I'll give you an example. Uh, if the delta is significant, like to half, if you are selling twice the price across in a, in a 60 liter, 6,000 liter truck, you can actually gain up to 70 million naira from, from just one truck. So how are you going to stop someone who can just with, uh, with two trips across the border will make 17 times two, which is the price of the truck itself. So if you don't arrest it, then it's over. He has made his money. Versus when you take a truck legally, well, what's the cost of uh, a truck now? Maybe 60,000. You take it to Medu maybe 8 million naira, for instance, to Medugri. The legitimate value you have is less than 500,000 naira. So why would I see 70 million naira and then take all the trouble, go to my degree, keep it in the fuel station for one month and just make three to 400,000 naira? The challenge you have in, in all these countries, you have taxation on PMS. We don't have tax here. So many, in many of these countries, actually government revenue is dependent on the taxes that is coming on, on, on PMS. So you'll see that until you balance for that, you recover your market costs and add taxation on it, there is no way you will ever get to a situation where there is some kind of a market parity between us and our neighbors. But you will not be losing money. As, as long as uh, you are not in a subsidy regime, you won't lose money. Well, that's uh, the GCU of NMPC Limited in that interview with Newsman. But you can catch a fuller version on our Business Morning program by 10. AM. Well, let's talk politics now. The People's Democratic Party, a former governor of Ekiti State and a chieftain of the party, Mr. Ayofayoshi, has expressed regret over the crisis rocking the former leading party in Nigeria. Well, he said the suspension and the counter suspension within the party has brought the PDP too low to the level of embarrassment, which according to him is not necessary. Adding that the current crisis in the main opposition party is as a result of a loss of the 2023 election. He was against our political program, Sunday Politics. The, the current situation in our party has made a mockery of suspension and counter suspension. Has made a mockery, especially at that level of leadership. And uh, sad, sad, sadly enough, current situation in the party has uh, taken the party so low, the level of embarrassment that is most unnecessary. No due respect to our governor, managing our, our states wonderfully, wonderfully well. Where, 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 where is the party? What are we talking about? Where, 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 do we say the, the party is in shape? Well, elections has come and gone. No doubt there was a G5 network. Elections had come and gone. And because the party suffered a loss, I think the consequences of that loss is haunting the party. Now to the Labour Party, as a crisis bedeviling the party continues, the leadership uh, in Lagos State says it is making progress with resolving the challenges facing uh, the party and also positioning it uh, to play an active role in the country's political struggle. Well, this was disclosed at the party's uh, leaders and members hosted its stakeholders in Lagos. The governorship candidate of the party, uh, Badibo Rhodes Viver, and the national coordinator of the obedient movement, Eunice Atanko, were among those who attended the meeting, which they claim is meant to foster a stronger and more unified Labour Party. Away from politics now, operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the NDLEA, at the Martella Mohammed International Airport, Ikeja, Lagos, have arrested a Thailand returnee, uh, Ogwejo for Nemeka Simon Peter, for importing 13.3 uh, kilograms of heroin worth over 3.192 billion naira, allegedly. Operatives of uh, the agency at uh, three of the nation's seaports 
and others are said to have also intercepted large consignments of opioids with a combined monetary value of 2 or 22 0.7 billion naira. A statement by NDLA's Director of Media and Advocacy uh, says that Mr. Ogwejo 4 was arrested on Monday, October the 7th, while attempting to smuggle out of the airport the illicit drug concealed in six backpacks packed into two big suitcases. And the presidency has clarified that Nigeria was not among those who competed in the 2024 United Nations Human Rights Council elections, which held on October the 9th, according to the press statement signed by the Special Advisor on Information and Strategy, Mr. Bayo Nonuga. Nigeria was not snobbed, stating that any votes mistakenly attributed to Nigeria during the recent election were likely cast in error by other nations. In line with such elections into international bodies, countries vying for such positions usually receive regional endorsement. And it says Nigeria's focus has been on supporting these endorsed candidates to strengthen collective African representation. The United States government has uh, piled more charges on the earlier $20 million bank fraud case against the founder and chairman of domestic carrier Airpiece, Mr. Alan Oyema, as he continues, in their words, to loot trial in an American court in the last five years. In a statement published on the United States Attorney's Office, Northern District of Georgia's website, Mr. Oyema has been charged in a superseding indictment with obstruction of justice for submitting false documents to the U.S. government in an effort to end an investigation of him that resulted in earlier charges of bank fraud and money laundering. But AP Limited has been reacting uh, to the media reports of the U.S. Department of Justice indictment against its chairman, Mr. Onyema, and Chief of Finance and Administration, Mrs. Ejiro Egara. A statement issued in Lagos and signed by the airline's management reads in part, these charges leveled against our post holders are part of an extended legal process stemming from earlier accusations of financial misdeeds that date back several years. While the charges have been expanded, it is essential to emphasize that both Dr. Onyema and Mrs. Eaga remain innocent, and these are mere allegations and the case is still in court. The airline added that its legal team is fully engaged with the matter and is working to ensure that justice prevails. Well, outside the country, more than 60 people have been injured in a drone strike targeting the Benyamina region of northern Israel. That's according to medics. In a statement, Voluntary Emergency Response Organization United at Zala said the conditions of the wounded range from critical to mild. It said all had been taken to five regional hospitals, either by ambulance or helicopter. Early on, two Israeli tanks had reportedly destroyed the main gate of a United Nations interim force in Lebanon position in the south of the country. The clash follows the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's call on the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to remove peacekeeping forces in southern Lebanon immediately. And the Super Eagles of Nigeria, well, are in Libya for the return leg of the Africa Cup of Nations qualification against the Mediterranean Knights uh, tomorrow. But their arrival has not been without hiccups. Videos posted online showed the team waiting at the airport with reports saying the Super Eagles were being denied entrance into Libya and were held up at the Abrak airport for over four hours. It was reported that about an hour to land it, the Nigerian aircraft approaching its destination, Benghazi, was diverted to another city more than two hour drive from the original destination. Well, definitely antics not needed uh, for the good sport of football. But what have you been saying about these issues and more? Well, Bukala joins me now as we walk through uh, the trends. But uh, Bukala, what do you have for us? Uh, quite a lot, uh, Cardi, but I hate to disappoint you that um, I don't have so much of good news to report from trends today. Nigerians have been seeing a whole lot mm. about um, plans by the House of Representatives to establish a Bola University, Bola Tinubu <sighs> University, to Ooh. promote languages. There's also a bit of um, news from the NNPCL uh, following intervention by the DSS now, promising to release 15 billion naira worth of field to independent marketers. Right. Uh, the details of that are not so clear, but of course Nigerians have been speaking about that. The only uh, cheering news is from the international community. Of course, we'll get to know that uh, shortly. Well, let's start with um, 
that Bola Tinubu University <laughs> this morning. Rep Seek Establishment of Bola Tinubu University. Of course, this followed a bill sponsored by the Deputy Speaker, uh, Honorable Benjamin Kalu, and eight others. And it is aimed at establishing a university for the promotion of learning of Nigerian languages. And Timi Niger is the first writer this morning and they say this is long overdue sad that most nigerians can't write in their native languages now i don't know if this is sarcasm or this is candor but this, this is one. true uh, a lot of nigerians can't write in their native languages well and that, that, that's a truth so uh, i think there's a lot of things together in this particular one uh, <laughs> but that university is meant or is the plan is to situate it in abia state uh, right, uh, it's passed first reading the bill. I, I know that a lot of people have issues with naming a university after the president currently, particularly with the reality around them. So this is obviously not something a lot of people want to hear. Mm -hmm. But then the purpose of it, uh, which is maybe the baby and the bathwater, is now the, I think is is the issue that we also should talk about. Is it's there a way we can that achieve? that needs to be born in the first place. Shouldn't there be family planning no, in no. this particular so situation? So which is the baby, which is the bathwater? Particularly bath because of the economic situation. Uh, this baby shouldn't have been born in the first place. So, the, uh, so I think both parties should, should have been... Uh, you know, shown some form of discretion. So let me explain what the baby is in this case. <laughs> Nigerians learning their native languages so that you want to have people from outside now coming to teach Nigerian their native language. So that is a baby, right, I think, in this case. The bathwater, I imagine, for people is the other adjoining issues. But let's look at what uh, <laughs> TV Niger has to say. I says, this is, okay, no, you've taken that already. Joe Amadi is next saying this is a misplaced priority. So that's a bathwater. Nigerians are hungry and suffering, unable to feed or care for their health with rising petrol and food costs. The government should be more focused on solving the problems in this country, the user says. Well, M. Aminu speaks my mind, so I didn't want to jump the gun, and that's why I just waited for <laughs> for the time to come to read Aminu's uh, comment. And Aminu says, a lot of existing universities have departments of linguistics studies, for crying out loud. Let's focus on other issues that can alleviate the current hardship persisting on most Nigerians. Have you funded uh, adequately the federal universities that, you know, are available at the right. moment? They are, you know, on strike every other time in the year and, you know those are real challenges of you know um ensuring that there is financial autonomy for the universities we're still talking about that we have not exited that and you're at the list of universities that you know you want to create this is just one out of many by the so way so let me let me help you make the, the work easier for nigerians this bill as you said earlier on sponsored by deputy speaker ben Kalu and eight others so these are people who represent you Right. These are your representatives. So you now begin to ask them, is this what we asked you to do? Maybe. We don't know, by the way, if this is what the those they are representing asked them to do. So let me mention the other lawmakers. So maybe you can ask them, write a letter, go to the office and say, well, this is not what we asked you to do. Or, good job, this is what we asked you to do. Uh, so they include uh, Inua, Karba, Nasir Sheu, Alex, Ikwecheg, Bako, Seni, Amobi Oga, Akin Rotimi, Halim Zabdulai, and Felix Oweke. So um, over to you now, members of the constituency. But um, let's take a moment. <laughs> we'll let's, leave it at that. Let's go to um, the Senate now, right? And the Senate president has been trending, uh, continues to trend. It was very, it was top trend uh, yesterday. And it's because of a, a video, right, which began to trend up in a nine second video uh, where he said this. We'd like you to watch the first part that has been trending and then we'll give you a broader context to that video. So this is the first bit of the video where he said that wherever you find food, eat it. So take a listen. So I urge members that times are difficult and wherever you see free food, please endeavor to, <laughs> endeavor to avail yourself. So wherever you see food, endeavor to avail yourself. So this trended and a lot of people, you know, bashed the president of Senate, understandably, because a lot of people believe that he has some sort of penchant for making what they deem to be insensitive comments, particularly in the context. But hey, we looked closer and guess what? That video is not recent. You'll have noticed by the background, right? This is not what the Senate chamber looks like today. It doesn't have that mm -hmm. dotted white background with a coat of arms. That was the makeshift chamber uh, that he had to use when renovation was, was on and re renovation has since ended. So why don't you take a listen to the video, the full video in context so you understand what he was saying and then uh, we'll come back. There will be a, another a, a dinner 
uh, for the Senate President and the Deputy Senate President at 7.30 p.m. today. The venue will be at the Chopstick uh, Mississippi Ministers here, Maitama. So uh, this announcement is from distinguished Senator Dan Duse Mohammed. Apparently, it is not uh, being funded by the uh, government, neither is it being funded by the National Assembly, and it is uh, his initiative. So I urge members that times are difficult, and wherever you see free food, please endeavor to <laughs> endeavor to avail yourself. Th thank you, distinguished Senator Dandisi. Amen. Yes. So evidently, this is the work of, um, you know, YouTube merchants or social media merchants who Politicians uh, detractors. <laughs> practice shovel journalism. So where we say the truth on this part of government and we criticize government for not rising to the occasion and mm. filling their own end of the social contract, you know, for purveyors of fake news, we must uh, also uh, send a harsh word to them as well. This, is, this leaves a very sour taste in the mouth and uh, projecting people negatively where it is needless um, is very low, yeah. Cardi, so very low. The date for that video when we dug deeper was actually June 14, mm -hmm. 2023, just right after the 10th Assembly was inaugurated. This is not months ago, this is over a year ago. And you see the context, he was speaking to um, his colleagues, saying, colleagues, wherever you find food, eat. But again, we can talk about other things around the National Assembly, but this was a miss, particularly for those who went to town. So be uh, wary it. before you share it, by the yeah. way. It's a clickbait. Yeah. So it's just for you to spread fake news. And that's why so it's important to stay with us right it. here on Channels yeah. Television for verified news. Just one more, Bukola, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, um, well, the feat that was achieved by SpaceX and other, you know, well, professionals in that uh, field. And just yesterday, Mechazilla caught uh, the super heavy booster. And I'm sure you're wondering, what is Mechazilla? What is heavy booster, right? Uh, so for some time now, Elon Musk of SpaceX has been pumping a lot of money because he wants to, of course, make humans multi-planetary. So you can stay on Earth today. If you can afford it, that is, you stay on Earth today, then next week you can say, I want to go to Mars. And next time I want to go to the moon. That's not possible now because first it's very expensive and we've not been able to tighten up the technology. So yesterday was very groundbreaking because they decided to build a, a mechanism that can catch the super booster. The super booster is what basically propels whatever you want to send to space. So the goal is to ensure that you're able to catch it, mm -hmm. which is cheaper mm -hmm. than building uh, maybe a pad for receiving it, which is much more expensive. expensive. It lands and then it doesn't make commuting easier, whether to commute people or to commute equipment, supplies and the rest. So if you're able to catch it, it's easier. So they've been working on this and yesterday it became successful. It became successful. Mm -hmm. So you could see the Mechazilla, by the way, which is a, uh, a hybrid Mecha for the mechanics and Zilla, which is gotten from Godzilla, you know, Godzilla with the arms, so <laughs> catching it. So that's the explanation. So that way it's cheaper to go back and forth. You don't need a lot of, um, you know, infrastructure and you can just do it fast. So maybe Bukola, next time you see an hour, she'll be reporting from Mars. <laughs> you go first, Gary. <laughs> Whatever happens to ladies first, Bukola. No, 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 not ladies first, Tamara. You go first. Let's test Gary with this. Well, well, since he knows so much about it anyway. So uh, when he returns, sis, then Jeffrey and I can... <laughs> come on, what happens to Kamara, Jeff? Bukola, we're going together. But let's take a look at what people have been saying okay. uh, about this one. Uh, Alex yeah. comes first this morning and Alex says, finally, after 20 years, it seems almost certain we're going to Mars. This is beyond incredible. Congrats to the entire SpaceX team. Well done. Hey, this guy spent a lot, billions of dollars. But, but Kaida, you know what, what comes I know what mind? is coming next, Bukola, so let it out. When you've solved a lot of problems, mm. you've solved the problem of hunger, you've solved the problem of, um, uh, you know, being able to afford your other bills, healthcare and all of that, <laughs> that's when you can think <laughs> about investing in space such that people can commute, you mm. know, and say, okay, I want to live on Earth today and then, you know, I want to spend my vacation in space. Come on, Nigerians. Uh, we're, we're very far away from that time. Okay. So, uh, we have not even begun to play catch up. But guess what? Mm -hmm. We'll have a conversation in the coming hours, days maybe, with mm -hmm. young Nigerians that are actually championing 
you know, space tech. It's going to be very interesting I, for I our we can, viewers. We can, we can bring an up close, you know, yeah, image. View. So let's show viewers, you, uh, yeah. you know, Mechazilla catching uh, the booster. And uh, hey, there you go. So it was re We're now down to returning, and people were thinking, would he catch it? You see, it was a bit far from Mechazilla, and they were thinking, oh gosh, this is going to be another disaster. And it just went right into it. This was the moment right here. So Historic. the arm caught it. You don't need a launch pad, you don't need extra, you know, equipment, infrastructure and cost. Boom! And there you have it. Historic. Really historic. Yeah. But um, Bukola is just saying historic. She has other issues with this particular one. But some will tell you what this means, even beyond uh, the, uh, you know, what Elon Musk has in mind. You know, he's, he's quite brilliant and he thinks beyond what every other people think about. But hey, uh, the Nigerians, I don't know if we have more time, but Nigerians are thinking about other issues. Tell us about it. Petrol issues. Tell us about and it. And the Association of Poultry Farmers is warning that um, if, you know, drastic measures are not taken, the price of a crate of eggs could move from 6,000 thousand five hundred naira to ten ten thousand naira uh, shortly you know so we're not thinking about eggs right now currently. so how many eggs are in a crate uh 24 24 yeah so if it's ten thousand naira for 24 or oh, 30 rather okay I should count again when I get home so 30 that would be how much for that would be about six or seven hundred naira for one egg no no way no that would be three hundred plus That'll be 300 plus per egg. Or one egg. If it's if it's at, Ten, if it goes to 10,000 10, naira. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sh can we take comments? Let's yeah, just let's see take what comments. Nigerians are, are uh, and that's why we're saying say. we need to. <laughs> time is of the essence. Godwin has a first one uh, on this one. Bukola says poultry farmers are really struggling uh, to keep it at a reasonable price. It's very difficult to have to explain to your customers that it's not your fault uh, that the price keeps going up every two weeks. Government has to speed up the maize importation to make up for a shortfall due to insecurity. Oh, gosh. You know, uh, this just beats my imagination. I mean, we, we grow maize here in Nigeria, and I wonder why the feed for poultry mm. um, keeps going up, which is what is responsible for the increasing price of eggs in the country. You know, it's just a con contradiction yeah. that, you know, we can't, we can't bring together, we can't reconcile. Uh, Voice of Hausa, by the way, says uh, there's going to be that's going to be difficult for the masses to afford. Government mm. should give them the necessary support, even if it's a grant. So, so these are the issues. Of agriculture, oh, yeah. Please, we need answers to this. Amongst uh, so many other issues uh, that the ministry should respond to as far as food security is concerned. So, so it, then uh, it's mind boggling when we have these present challenges. And you see how politicians are carrying on. Uh, for example, take a look at what's happening in Rivers State. And you wonder if this continues for longer, what happens to governance? Uh, we saw videos of Rivers uh, LG chairman mm -hmm. removing former Governor Wike's name from council building. You know what? A lot of things are trended, but we need to take a moment now on the show. We can go on and on, but we're starting off with a big conversation around petrol. It's a round table. Mm. Is this the best we can do? This bitter pill, must we swallow it? Is there maybe an antidote to this new normal? We're starting off with that conversation in a few seconds. You don't want to go away. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Morning Brief right here on Channels Television. And as we continue with our conversation today, we're starting with the petrol price conundrum, dangerously hinged on the vagaries of uh, the price of crude oil in the international market. Uh, but of course, there are so many other variables to that. Um, and we will, as we say here now, or as we're seeing it, we, no one is exempt, whether, you know, regardless of the rung of the ladder that you belong to, uh, either it's the middle class, upper middle class, lower middle class, um, even the elite, you know, according to reports, some are really feeling the pinch uh, right now. But which way Nigeria, as far as petrol price is concerned? Because every other thing, you know, um, is affected when petrol price goes up. So we're going to be having this discussion today and uh, speaking to energy experts. So joining us today uh, to look at uh, this is Mr. Olapo De Shomomi, is an oil and gas expert and CEO CapTree Limited. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us on the program, Mr. Shomomi. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be here. And he's not alone, by the way. We also have Mr. Oyeyemi Oke. I hope I got it. Oke or Oke? Okay. Um, okay. He's also Oke, okay, yeah. He's also an energy expert and lawyer and accountant. Good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Shomomi, uh, with what seems to be the question that we've been asking, um, which is a sticking point, really. Uh, it, it seemed like it was... Um, uh, it's an anticlimax for Nigerians. We waited for about five to six years for the Dangote refinery to come on board, which was the hope uh, that Nigeria would exit petrol importation. Uh, but um, it seems that that is now eluding Nigerians. So what is the explanation for this? Before we begin to look at alternatives, how Nigerians can adjust to this new regime. Okay, good morning again, and thanks for the question. I think first and fundamentally, um, the issue of the Dangote refinery was not properly reported. And because of the way it was reported, it gave Nigerians the expectation that the prices will increase. I mean, the prices will come down. There are certain things that are outside the scope of any refinery when it comes to the price of the distilled products, the distillage. The most important component in terms of the, the factor that has the most significant price in the metrics is the crude oil itself. And crude oil pricing is quite universal, I mean, not because it's a commodity. So to that extent, when the reportage was going on with respect to the Dangote refinery and what it will have for Nigerians, for some reason, people did not um, do the research well. The information was not verified. And the business people who stood to benefit from the populist views of that did not, did not think it was necessary for them to correct that notion. So basically, we are left to the same, to the same issues as they were. In, the, in simple terms, we are left to the reality. The, what the Dangote refinery will do at the end of the day is basically to eliminate the cost of transportation in terms if we were to import it. But it should be understood that it is a private refinery. They are not obligated as a private business to sell at the cheapest price. They are obligated to sell at a price that will take care of their shareholders. That's also another important factor that has not been considered. And to that extent, they may not even be cheaper than imported products. So what has just basically happened was the kind of information that Nigerians were fed with. They were not fed with information that actually was a proper balance of the issues. And, you know, once you are not dealing with truths at a point in time, the, 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 truth, the truth will come to, to speak. So that's basically what has happened in, this, in the case of the Dangote refinery. So before I go to Mr. Oke, I'd like to just, you know, uh, follow up on that a bit. You know, that, that's a difficult uh, pill to swallow. And um, the explanations are not necessarily adding up, particularly when you think about the fact that, you know, um, the cost of importation has been eliminated. Port charges, according to analysis of some experts, has also been eliminated. Uh, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, some uh, energy marketers uh, just about two weeks ago announced also uh, that the landing cost of petrol has reduced. 
And, you know, of course, there's also that factor of the reducing, in recent times, cost of crude oil in the international market. And when cost of crude oil reduces, that also impacts on the cost of refined petrol. So why is it not the same for Nigeria? Okay, so you, you brought up a number of factors, and they are very valid factors. But you see, the devil is in the details. Until somebody just sits down and actually do the math and look at the cost component. Because yes, they say the cost of transportation in, in importation that is reduced. It's not importation itself. It's not the cost of importation per se that's reduced. It's the cost of the transportation. It will be eliminated by the refinery. However, what if the refinery is not being operated optimally? And you know the cost of operations or the cost of refining locally may even be higher than the cost of refining abroad. You know, there are many factors that are there. So it's not just enough to uh, highlight these factors. You still have to put the figures into these factors and see how the numbers fall. It is only then, then only then, that you can actually say this thing should be cheaper, this thing should be, I mean, should be, should be more expensive. Another important thing is that people seem to forget that the Dangote refinery have not actually said They've not made it public in terms of how much they are really selling their product. The NMPC has, at the time, mentioned how much they bought from them, and Dangote said that that was not the price. So until you have an idea of how much they are really pushing it out, before you now be able to actually do a proper comparison with what is being and um, what is being com what is coming in from outside the country. But the truth be told, and this is where the real issues are, is that it's a private business and the costs, I mean, these costs are things that are largely determined by their own internal metrics, not necessarily by populist views. And that needs to, there, there needs to be a balance there in terms of Nigeria's expectations. Uh, well, I, I hope that, you know, Nigerians can um, absorb, internalize uh, that explanation. Let me come to you now, uh, Mr. Oke. Um, uh, do you have contrary views as to what Mr. Shomi has said, particularly about why um, energy security seems to be eluding Nigerians, despite you know, um, the long wait and arrival of our own homegrown refinery? Okay. Um, I think I, I agree with Mr. Shomi. Um, um, I think it's just to add a few points to what he has mentioned. Now, um, in as much as uh, the cost of uh, haulage, as it were, or whether I would say freight cost rather, uh, may have been eliminated as a result of uh, local refining uh, based on uh, the Dangote refinery. Let's not forget uh, that uh, the some costs or some components of the cost are still dollarized, right? Uh, the cost of the investment was largely in USD. Uh, operational costs, I'm sure it will be a mix of USD and uh, Naira. And all of this, as Mr. Shomi has said, would roll up into what we we'll call the unit cost, right? And uh, if we are still having fluctuation of the Naira, right, there is a likelihood that we will continue to have perhaps uh, increase in, uh, in uh, fuel costs. Now, that does not mean that uh, the, the refinery does not have some of its advantages. Uh, I think the, the big advantage in my view would be uh, the fact that um, we can maybe uh, relatively say we have a bit of uh, uh, energy security in terms of constant supply, right? But the question is at what cost? And I guess that is what is uh, painful to Nigerians as of now. Uh, that's one. Two is uh, also the uh, supply of uh, or the yeah supply of uh, crude to the refinery in Naira, and also uh, the payment for refined products in Naira. What that does is that you have a bit of uh, reduced pressure on uh, the Naira in terms of uh, demand for foreign exchange. Perhaps that may stabilize the exchange rates. Uh, in the medium to, to long term. Uh, so uh, in as much as uh, it's a private business, uh, costs are dollarized, uh, Naira is uh, fluctuating, or uh, for the lack of better expression, I don't want to say depreciating. These are all the things that uh, determine uh, the pricing uh, of, of the commodity. And I mean, 
whether we like it or not, as Mr. Shomi has rightly said, it's a private business uh, that uh, not necessarily uh, looking at, uh, I mean, we, it will not necessarily look at uh, how this affects uh, you and I as a common man. Uh, every business is in is uh, established to make profits and uh, perhaps uh, what needs to be done uh, by government is to ensure that there is uh, what I would call uh, availability of crude oil for the refinery and two would also be a way whereby we can be looking at things around production subsidy perhaps as opposed to consumption subsidy. Well, let me follow up uh, with this one. You're also an accountant uh, as well as a lawyer. I mean, you're your experience will, will come to bear here uh, of sorts. First, I think this is just reiterating what the Senate President, Kosala uh, Kwabio, said about the Ngote refinery put into shame uh, previous Nigerian governments uh, who could not even fix refineries. So I think we're just making that point clear yet again that we're now having to depend and all the conversation seems to be centering around uh, private business, as you said it. So uh, let's, let's, you know, come back on track and really focus on, on, on you know, the, the government, those who we have elected and we expect them uh, to do right by the people. Looking at the current price now of petrol, um, as an accountant, help us do the adding up. Does it add up for you? Do you really think now is the time? I know that there are other considerations, but I mean, the product, the product rather, it does not exist in isolation. It exists in a context. A product is not a product uh, just by itself. It's a product because there are consumers who are willing and able to pay. I think a lot of people are maybe willing, but able to pay is the question right now. So if a litre of petrol is selling for 1,000 plus, a lot of people have not even increased, increased the minimum wage, they've not started earning it. Does it add up? Does the timing add up? Uh, does it make sense really at this time that people will be buying petrol for that amount? Um, I would answer not as an accountant, but I would answer as a Nigerian. There you right? go. And um, answering as a Nigerian means that there's a lot of pain in uh, our shoes. Um, the earning power is not increasing. Um, if you look at it comparative to how uh, fuel in itself has increased in the last 16 months, uh, um, I think uh, when this government came into power, it's, uh, it was selling at about 195, and now we are at about a, a thousand plus. What that means is that we are over 400 uh, percent in terms of increase, right? Um, the, the minimum wage was not increased by 400 uh, percent. If I'm to do uh, what I will call back of the envelope mathematics, but what I what my concern is is the fact that uh, some of these policies have been introduced uh, in as much as um, you have um, governments say that uh, there are palliatives or other programs to alleviate uh, the impact. I don't think uh, uh, you and I have seen much change or much effect of those, uh, those so-called palliatives. And uh, that is where the problem is because um, it, it creates the question of sustainability in terms of re, uh, removing uh, fuel subsidy 100%, uh, because what will happen is that uh, the pricing will be subject to the vagaries of the international market and also uh, the strength of uh, the Nigerian currency. Uh, based on the fact that, one, uh, the crude oil is an international commodity, um, you would, what would happen would be that uh, pricing would always change based on international shocks in the market. Uh, as we saw, I think uh, last week, whereby there were concerns with regards to the uh, escalating tension between uh, Israel and Iran, and how this would also affect the price of the international commodity. So what this means essentially for Nigerians and for you and I, is that if we don't take time, or if care is not taken actually, uh, we may find ourselves buying petrol beyond uh, 1,000, 1,000 to 1,005 in the event we have uh, increase in, in the price of uh, crude oil. So uh, to answer your question directly, the mathematics is not adding up in terms of the earning power uh, and the purchasing power and also the price of uh, the commodity on one side and also the rippling effect of inflation. Now. Uh, what would happen, right, or what we see happen is that uh, 
perhaps uh, people will start looking at uh, other uh, alternatives, other fuel sources, I see, for example, CNG, and perhaps uh, also looking at uh, other ways to minimize the impact of uh, both the pricing of the commodity and inflation uh, in general. But these, um, I mean, the government initiatives in terms of uh, uh, alleviating the impact of this um, um, price change right. and this uh, shocks needs to be looked at right. uh, to, to cascade to you and I as uh, Nigerians. So, I mean, if you say the mathematics is not adding up, then we maybe have to use a different formula. So let me go to Mr. Showmi. Thank you for that. So Mr. Showmi, I remember there was a time that if you had malaria, what would be prescribed would be chloroquine. And after a while, we've seen, you know, the medical world moved to something else, perhaps as a result of, you know, resistance uh, to chloroquine, malaria's resistance. Uh, well, it's bitter as well, you know, the side effect. So obviously it wasn't quite working. So they had to use something else. We can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. But this is what I need your help with, Mr. Shomi. Uh, the GCO uh, of NMPC Limited has been speaking about subsidy removal, how it was meant to end arbitrage, equalization, and all of that. And he says that it's on track right now. So it would seem that on the end of government, or at least NMPC Limited, which is owned by government, right, they see that this policy is yielding results. But on the side of Nigerians, all they feel from this policy mostly is pain, right? And that's why, I'm sorry, I guess this is not really adding up. So, so is this the best antidote uh, to the current economic challenge, uh, to the current uh, hardship faced by Nigerians? Is this the best we can do? Some see it as chloroquine. It's bitter. So what is the alternative, really? Okay, so th there are two things to that question. That is, is there are actually two questions in one. One is the impact on the economy at the moment, and the other is about economic increase. I mean, basically expansion of the economy, or should I say healing of the economy, so to speak. So for perspective, uh, first of all, I'm not an economic expert, but there is some part of it that is energy related. So on my own part, what I did do was do a study of some of the nations that have gone through some of the things we are going through now. Um, UK in the late 70s when Margaret Thatcher came in and they were trying to move from socialism to more of a free market. Uh, China in the 60s, Brazil in the 80s. And in the, the case of Brazil was particularly interesting because just like we were talking about increase uh, every two weeks, there was a time that Brazil was experiencing increase twice a day. And things do happen. So in simple terms, when you're trying to reform there are these things do happen. That is what we must understand. And that's why I said, I've always said is that if we don't want reform, I mean, it's possible we actually don't want reform as a people. We need to actually have a sit down and agree that we don't want reform. We'll continue the way that we should go to. But if we do, then we need to think outside the box. And this is where the healing aspect comes in. One of the things I think that has not been considered very well is the capacity for us to actually end forex as individuals and as local components rather than just looking at a solution from the government only or from a particular place only and that only resonates with that part where you said that if you have been taking chloroquine for a long time and chloroquine and the body the body system had grown resistance to the chloroquine there may be a need to try another drug some of the richest nations in the world have some of the least population. And a typical example is the Scandinavian countries. So you're talking about Norway, you're talking about Finland, you're talking about Denmark. Um, Sweden has a population of less than 10 million. Um, Norway has a population of slightly over 5 million. But one of the main things you will find out with these nations, really, is the fact that for their companies, for SMEs there, they encourage them to go abroad from when they are less than two years old. But from when, they are, when, from when they are less than two years old, the implication of that is that virtually every company that you have there attracts money from abroad. The, the implication also is that if we have five to 10 companies in every local government, for example, 774 of them, and they are encouraged to go abroad and they start to bring in $10,000. So if you have 
to fifty thousand dollars in every local government that is independent of government that is independent of the traditional systems of bringing in forex the implication of that is that you bring in a new income you change the revolution of how the local governments operate and you you, you cause a total transformation of things so those are the things that we need to look at in terms of solutions that can change the way we do things as a nation. That would be my contribution. Uh, and I wonder, you know, how long uh, we're going to be uh, wait for these reforms, you know, to kick in and begin to yield results. And for those countries that you cited, you know, uh, perhaps we should also check um, what the other uh, results or parameters of their national life was, i.e. cost of housing, um, you know, um, cost of um, energy, other, you know, uh, aspects of energy, you know, besides the cost of petrol, before we conclude, uh, you know, that uh, they are the same in terms of, um, you know, um, you know uh, consequence as far as Nigeria is concerned. But I I'd like to follow up on, um, you know, the issue about transparency. Why if there was more transparency and accountability in this whole process, uh, will there be, will the cost of petrol be less? And I'm coming to you now, Mr. Oke. Um, do, do you sense that, uh, you know, uh, we're not being told enough that we need to know about the negotiations, uh, you know, between NNPCL and the homegrown refinery? And if there is enough transparency in the whole process, um, what will be the realistic price of petrol? Um, so if you recall, and I think that happened about maybe three weeks ago with regards to the first uh, volume of uh, products that were lifted from the Redangote refinery. And uh, it seemed like there was a bit of uh, uncertainty in terms of what the pricing was. Um, I think uh, NMPCL mentioned that um, the the products were lifted at about 898. Uh, I think this was debunked uh, by the refinery, but we never got, or the refinery never gave us what the cost was or the lifting cost was. Um, I agree with you with regards to perhaps there seemed to be some opaqueness in terms of what the lifting cost is. Uh, and, you know, apart from the lifting costs, there are other costs like uh, the various levies, the NMDPRA levy, the gas infrastructure levy, and perhaps uh, haulage before you now look at what the estimated uh, landing cost would be. Um, I think um, that that part in terms of uh, the what the levies are and the estimated cost of haulage uh, seems a bit clear. What is not clear as of today is uh, how much actually is the lifting cost from the refinery. Now, um, perhaps because of the fact that uh, at the time in September, uh, what happened was that uh, it was just a direct uh, sale between or direct arrangement between uh, NMPCL and uh, the, the refinery uh, without any other uh, marketer involved. Uh, so perhaps uh, maybe on the basis of the agreement which uh, both parties have, uh, they decided not to uh, let us know what the product, uh, I mean, what the cost is. But I feel that we may be seeing more transparency now since we have, or there's a potential that uh, other marketers now come into the fray. Uh, we may be seeing greater transparency, also competition. Uh, in terms of uh, product availability, uh, and this may ultimately affect uh, price. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, yes, transparency may work, but the truth is uh, the other elements of the value chain also needs to be considered, right? And the other elements will be what is the cost from hauling, perhaps from uh, Lagos to Mobi in Adamawa, right? Uh, and the cost is not only uh, cost in terms of Naira and Kobo. The cost also is in terms of what is the state of the infrastructure. Mm. Uh, if I'm to move from uh, Aja or uh, Ibejuleki, where the refinery is located, up until Mubi, how many days will it take me? What is the cost per kilometer in terms of uh, maybe diesel costs or CNG costs, depending on the fuel which the relevant trucks are using? And all of this will roll up into determining what uh, the unit cost would be.
And you know those questions are important because um, there are reports that groups are urging the NNPCL to remove so many heating charges from the uh, cost of petrol uh, purchased from uh, Dangote refinery. Uh, and besides that, you know, we got reports today also that uh, uh, the company has released 15 billion naira worth of fuel to marketers. So the question again is, um, uh, is there any uh, obstruction to direct negotiation uh, between uh, the marketers and Dangote refinery? They're all very important. But let's move to alternatives now. And uh, for Ni this is especially important for Nigerians. What should they be doing now? My colleague talked earlier about how, you know, the minimum wage, 70,000 naira, has not even begun to be implemented for some, uh, yet they must adjust to the current reality. So is a CNG a viable alternative for uh, the majority of Nigerians? Have we achieved uh, the necessary penetration for a good number of Nigerians to say, oh, I want to transit to CNG? Um, help us do the calculation. What is the cost of conversion? And, um, you know, what, what would be the price of CNG uh, per, is it per liter now? Or, you know, the amount that Nigerians would require to do the necessary travel per month. Uh, Mr. Shomi, let me bring that to you now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think gas has always been cheaper. And um, CNG, even though it is giving high-powered um, attention by the government now, has been around for more than 10 years, with NIPCO having uh, done something in Benin, where, the, where they are the trial station. The issue about CNG in terms of its practicalities to Nigerians is about the spread and the infrastructure for it. And, that, and that's also the bain of a lot of the domestication of our energy options. So um, if you look at petrol, because petrol will be using it for close to 100 years, there are filling stations in virtually every hamlet anywhere in this nation. You cannot, so you will need something like that for CNG to be practical. So, but in terms of the science of it, in terms of the, um, the economics of it, it's definitely a viable option. In fact, it's definitely a cheaper option. So, I mentioned infrastructure. The next part of it is the upstream part. Yes, we have gas. We're a gas nation. But that gas needs to be processed for it to be useful. So it's like having river water or ocean water around you. You can have a lot of river water, but you may not have drinking water. So the gas that we need to use, for that Nigerians need to use, that will be converted to CNG, LPG, and all that needs to be processed. We do not, at the moment, have that kind of upstream investment, upstream amount of gas that will take care of the nation at the scale that we exist. So there needs to be investment in the upstream aspect for gas. That's also another very important factor. But once those two factors in terms of the spread of infrastructure is taken care of, in terms of upstream investments are taken care of, then very well, you have a significant option to petrol. Not only will it drive petrol down by the forces of competition, it will also give Nigerians something that is safer for their vehicles, which will make the engine to last longer, and something that is definitely cheaper. So ultimately, the right, um, the right attention is being given, the right pressure is also being given, and we hope the interim factors will be removed in the shortest possible time. Ms. Oka, do you want to speak to the, the costing as well? Because the, it, I mean, it's easier said, right, than done. It's even cheaper said than done at, at the same time. So uh, what is the cost eventually? Does it really add up again when you look at the earnings of Nigerians? Um, as Mr. Shumi has said, I think pricing of CNG um, is, uh, I mean, relatively uh, cheaper, right, perhaps based on the pricing which we have today is about 25% uh, of the cost of uh, a liter when you compare it with what uh, the fuel, the PMS is saying. So essentially, if we do rough mathematics, what it means is that if I'm using a CNG uh, power drain, I'm having 75% savings as opposed to um, another person who is uh, driving a PMS uh, fueled car. But uh, Mr. Mr. Shoumi also mentioned something about infrastructure. And I'll tell you, I will give you what I call a practical example with regards to a business which I'm involved in. 
which is a logistics business that was considering um, converting its, uh, its trucks to a CNG-powered uh, uh, vehicle or CNG-powered vehicles. And one of the concerns which we had were two concerns. One is infrastructure, which Mr. Shoumiya said, uh, I mean, if I'm supposed to take a truck, let's say from uh, Lagos to Kano, for example, the question is, uh, where are the CNG stations, right? Where can I refuel? And because of the fact that the CNG as a type of fuel has lower density, so what it means is that it's not heavy and uh, it burns quicker. So I may not be able to use the the trucks, uh, I mean, to say, oh, I have loaded a truck, let's say, for example, from Lagos that is going to kind of without refueling at some point. And that made uh, made some type of, uh, what's it called, made the business halt its decision in terms of CNG conversion. So um, we need significant investment around permission of uh, refuel stations uh, before we can have the impact, which or the desired impact. Um, in terms of investment also, Mr. Shoumi has also mentioned the, the challenge on the upstream investment side. And uh, again, one of the things that needs to be considered is before we can attract the type of uh, upstream investment that we want, uh, uh, we, we need to also look at pricing. And perhaps maybe that would also lead to issues around uh, escalation of pricing because as of now, uh, gas prices are, are, are fairly regulated uh, uh, by the regulators, and that is also a consideration. Uh, but to answer your question directly, CNG definitely is a viable alternative. We need infrastructure to be able to push it, mm. and definitely it is cheaper uh, than gasoline as of today. And the question really is, is the investment in the necessary measure of infrastructure, is it being done as fast enough? Because the price of petrol is not waiting for anyone. It keeps going up. Uh, so um, how long do we need to wait for the needed penetration such that a good number of Nigerians can begin to transit uh, to CNG? And the regulation that you talk about uh, there, uh, is, is, it, um, um, is it affecting price of conversion as much as it is affecting the price that CNG itself is being sold? I ask this because uh, there, are, there were reports that conversion was 250,000 Naira. But I don't know how far it is true, but it's being said now it's being increased to 800,000 Naira. Maybe you should quickly answer that and then you can take okay. Mr. Shomi's last words as well. Okay, so co the cost of conversion, you know, when uh, the initiative was introduced, I think in November last year, uh, the cost of conversion was estimated uh, between 300 to 600,000 uh, Naira. Again, do not forget that some of these conversion kits are imported, if not all, right? And what this means is that uh, if you have a, a fluctuating uh, currency, again, I would want to run from the precision currency. But if you have a fluctuating currency, what would happen is that uh, uh, you will find out that uh, the cost would increase as the currency continues to fluctuate. And that would be the reason uh, for the increase from perhaps 250 to 800,000 naira. Now, let's not forget that uh, what government has done is to say, oh, we would have 1 million free installation kits for public uh, uh, transportation vehicles. Right? What that means is that private owners will have to uh, pay out of pocket. And the question you need to look at is, if I pay 800 to 1 million naira as the cost of conversion, what am I actually saving if I amortize it over a period of time? Is the savings actually uh, uh, sensible, bearing in mind also that uh, mm. I would need specialized forms of, I mean, types of mechanics to be able to attend to my vehicle mm. on a go forward basis? Yeah. So mm. those are some of the things to consider with regards to the cost of uh, cost of conversion. Oh, well, and even if um, you know the, the cost incurred would be made up for later on, it's important for these things to have a human face as well. Hence, uh, the need for us to continue to ask the questions about regulation. Uh, we must anchor at this point. Pardon me, Mr. Ashomi, we must anchor. I was going to take your last words, but we're out of time now. I'd like you to
So thank you so much, gentlemen. Mr. Labo De Shomi, um, oil and gas expert and CEO Cap Tree Limited. Thank you so much for your time. And Mr. Oyeyemi Oke, energy expert, lawyer and accountant. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we'll pause for a break now. When we return, we'll uh, hop on to the next leg of our conversation. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, the Minister of State for Steel Development, Mr. Obama Gary, is our guest on the program this morning. Uh, Minister, you're welcome to the morning brief. We'll just get straight to it uh, and speak to first uh, the policies of the government which you serve in, the President Bola Tinubu government, of which you're a member of cabinet. It would seem that Nigerians expect one thing, and uh, your government is doing the exact opposite. Nigerians expect an ease, uh, some sort of breather. The President said, let a poor breathe. What they're getting is high cost of petrol, energy, cost of living, and the rest. So help us start with this. What is the thinking in the government? Do you realize that you're not really doing what the people at least want you to do, or it's not even looking like it? Uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Honorable Minister. Go ahead, please. You will have, you will have to repeat your... Your questions again. It's okay. I'm happy to. Because My question is... Come back here. It was glitching a little bit, and I didn't get all of that. Right. It, it's okay. Uh, but I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, it's better. All right. So my question is quite simple. Right, so and it's a general right, uh, so feel of what is playing out right now. It would seem that Nigerians expect one thing, uh, but the government is doing the exact opposite. Nigerians expect ease, a breather, let the poor breathe, as the president said. But what they're getting is a high cost of petrol, over 1,000 hour, high cost of living, bitter pills to swallow. So I wanted to know what the thinking in government is. Do you recognize that some of these policies are not really meeting the yearnings and aspirations of Nigerians? Well, the best I can tell you is from where I sit in the Ministry of Steel Development. If you want to talk about the economy generally, you know who to talk to. But as a member of council, not shying away from the issues, I will tell you that, like I did the last time I was here, we are Nigerians, like all Nigerians out there, first and foremost. Uh, and of course, we feel everything that is there to feel or is being felt by Nigerians. In specific answer, direct answer to your question, government is doing a lot. It's probably because most people uh, are not looking very, very closely at the things government is doing. I'll give you just one example. In direct response, to the issues of uh, world price increases and how it affects the cost of transportation. I'm sure you witnessed uh, a program where Mr. President Asuajibola Ahmed Tunubu flagged off or commissioned some CNG buses. Those ones you saw were just those that were brought to the villa for the commissioning ceremony. There is a presidential committee on CNG that is right now working on uh, providing alternative uh, sources of fueling, the CNG that is, through making available conversion kits and uh, opening up many conversion centers. If you engage the presidential committee on the CNG, you will get the details. And also there is an association of, uh, I think, depot owners of Nigeria. They made contributions by supporting the government's initiative by way of uh, donation of CNG-powered buses. Many institutions and uh, business outfits are keen in 
And I think you should look further than the surface. You will get to see what the government is doing All right. in terms of bringing down the cost of transportation particularly and the cost of living generally. So, um, Honorable Minister, and, and, you know, hearing this again, I, I imagine how Nigerians feel. Because last year, well over a year ago, around June, the president in a nationwide broadcast uh, had said that um, part of the program of this government is to roll out buses across the state and local government for mass transit, the CNG buses, which he referred to. And then he said in his words, we have made provision to invest 100 billion naira between now and March 2024, right, to acquire 3,000 units of 20-seater CNG-filled buses. And we're just getting the buses in October. I mean, we see some of these policies. Again, how far-reaching they are is another question entirely because these are very little compared to the need. But then they are coming really late. Subsidy has been removed for well over a year. The impact has been felt for well over a year since May the 29th. And what we're getting is some sort of intervention in October 2024. So again, I ask, within government, uh, you know, settings, do you have these conversations that say, we made these promises and now we're coming at this time. First, do you acknowledge uh, the slow pace uh, failure to deliver on time, and do you at least have that feeling to apologize to Nigerians for putting them in this situation? That's a very hard one. And I, I would want to say that that's a harsh, that's a harsh one. Of course, we discuss issues. What else do we do at council other than discussing issues that uh, but in Nigeria and the problems we were elected to deal with. That is the major thing we do there. And uh, that was what Nigerians elected President Bola Ahmed Chinubu to do to solve the problems. And that is what we are doing. Between not uh, fulfilling promises and promises fulfilled that are coming late, like you said, which one would you prefer? I don't want us to go the way of pessimist. Let's be optimistic in our disposition, in our, in our relationship with the government. We should trust ourselves, we should trust the government. The government has genuine intentions and we are doing the best we, we can. No human endeavor is uh, free of uh, problems. And since this is one, we are doing the best we can. I will plead that you, 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 you be a little bit more, more patient with, uh, with the government, not giving excuses for, for lapses, no. Nothing deliberate, but of course, like I said earlier, being a human endeavor, we should make allowances for this little, little gaps uh, in delivery, time delivery. I think we should be more tolerant of uh, of the things we are, we are putting in place, where the president is working so, so hard to put in place to make life for Nigerians better. Well, Honorable Minister, Nigerians are, you know, looking everywhere for something they can hold on to that will enable them to trust the government. Um, and it seems that yeah. there is little, you know, to be able to hold on to, very little, because government seems to be promising one thing and then doing another. Uh, but I, I hate to disappoint you, sir. We're going to another equally more heartbreaking issue, which is the Ajaokuta steel yeah. plant. Uh, through many administrations over the last 40 years, it's been one failed oh. promise or the other to revive the plant, from oh. so, so gas oh. to, um, you know, TPZ, oh. the original company that built it, to Global Steel. GPE. Yeah, to Global Steel. And now we hear that this administration has signed a landmark deal to revive the plant with the original builders of the plant. What's in this agreement that has been signed? What is the cost implication? And what assurance are you giving us, uh, giving Nigerians now, that this will sail through and then um, we will celebrate a historical revival and operation of Ajaokuta steel plant? Thank you very much. I'm sure you know that there are two of us who are ministers in the Ministry of Steel Development. And uh, there are agencies we oversee. Unfortunately, 
a Jayakuta steel company doesn't fall within my purview. But that, that is not to say uh, I don't know what's going on there. The Honorable Minister will be in a better position to give you all the details. I will just tell you the highlights. Uh, yes, the government is very serious about revitalizing Ajaokuta. And beyond what you see, uh, because of the interest uh, President Bola Tinubu has particularly on Ajaokuta, he has commissioned some other firms to look directly. I told you the last time I was here that uh, experts from the Africa Development Bank and UNIDO are working or have taken stock uh, of what's on ground in Ajakuta with a view to giving suggestions or a clear roadmap on the easiest and the most cost-effective way of getting Ajakuta back on track. The much I can tell you is that that report has been submitted to Mr. President, and I'm coming here to tell you details of uh, uh, reports submitted to uh, Mr. President for a job he commissioned a firm to do. But I can guarantee Niger to Nigerians that we are set, we are on the issues, we are looking at the best way out of the situation. Yes, Ajayakuta has not been working optimally for a very long time, but we are doing, getting all the basics. Like I said earlier, we shouldn't be too, too lost in uh, complaining things are not working. We are doing the best we can to get these things rolling again. Nobody is happy with where Ajaokuta is. We are not blaming anybody. We are not passing the buck. We are addressing the issues. We, we have a report that is already submitted to the president, and the president will do his due diligence, look them over, subsequently bring it to council. This is my uh, thinking. And of course, when it gets to council, it will be discussed openly. I will look at the best option for the nation. And I keep saying, between rushing to, just for the optics, to say, okay, we have done this, we have done that, we are doing it better now, probably slower, but which one is better? Doing it very well or rushing to push out uh, deliveries, in quotes, out there, just to satisfy Nigerians that, yes, we are doing this, we are doing that. The most important, as far as I'm concerned, is getting the best deal for the country. And that's where we are uh, on Ajakuta right uh, now. Uh, let me quickly follow up on that. Since you're only able to give us the highlights, can you give us a timeline of when the revival um, you know, work will be delivered? A timeline. Will it be before the end of the first term? of this administration. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, does the deal also cover the National Mine um, Iron Ore Company, which is supposed to be supplying um, iron ore to a Jalkuta steel plant? As for a timeline, I told you my colleague works on Ajaokuta. You're talking about um, Nigerian Iron Ore Mining Company, the raw materials segment. Of the, of, the, of the business. They can't, there's no price for guessing that they have to work together. You can't uh, produce steel without the raw materials. So whatever, is, uh, whatever attention is being paid to Ajaokuta is also paid to uh, Itape, Iron Ore Mining Company, because that is where the raw materials for the production of steel are sourced. So it's like... Um, it's like the same place, but there are two entities. Uh, that one is for the raw materials, and this one is the steel manufacturing plant, but they work together. So everything is being done on both of them to make sure that they are up again.
All right. So let's speak to further specifics. And it's always important to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must commend you uh, for showing up for this conversation. Mm -hmm. We had a chat with you weeks ago and now again. Uh, it will be good to see other yeah. members of cabinet doing that as the uh, president, we understand, has ordered. Right. So let's speak to uh, specifics. Mm -hmm. And I want to draw some sort of similarity. Yeah. We saw what played out in the U.S., for yeah. example, uh, Space, SpaceX, a company, you know, doing some great stuff with space travel. We saw the uh, Mechazilla mm -hmm. catching uh, the booster rocket, and that's said to be like a major, uh, you know, a big deal when it comes to space travel. And you can see the kind of support that government has been given it, even though they had some back and forth. But uh, for your own ministry, because you've talked about how you want to revolutionize the ministry, ensure that it contributes to economic development with uh, industrialization and the rest. Mm -hmm. Can you give us maybe just one, two yeah. examples of, you know, uh, specifics, something that your ministry has been able to do in supporting industrialization and that is tangible for us to see? Have you been able to supply uh, some of the, you know, raw materials needed on a large scale? Maybe one specific or two in this more than one year in office. I'll give you three. Right now, we have advertised, the ministry that is, we have advertised a program that we have uh, rolled of It's been in the incubator for some time, and it's out there now. You probably haven't seen it, but we have a program that is a, a boot camp we're going to have in Onicha. We actually planned, like I said the last time I was here, we planned to train 10,000 Nigerian youth, but for budgetary constraints, it was cut down to 1,000, and the National Assembly, the Senate, graciously approved for us to train 700 young Nigerians at the Metallurgical Training Institute in Onicha. What we intend to do is to take artisanal welders, those who are already beginning to learn the trade, and those who are interested in learning the welding trade. It's, between, it's for between, uh, those between the ages of 18 to 40. The training uh, covers metal fabrication, foundries and mechanical maintenance, metallurgy, and things around it. What we intend to do is take 700 Nigerians, like I said, between the ages of 18 to 40, take them to Onicha for 30 days, take them through all the basics, after which they will be supported with a basic equipment after the extensive training covering the practical aspects of welding. All right. The business side, they will be attached to those already established for continuous mentorship. All right. What government intends to achieve is at the end of this boot camp, we would have taken 700 Nigerians off the job market. Okay. This 700 Nigerians have the capacity to set up on their own from the support by way of equipment the ministry intends to give after the training. Well, Honorable Minister. This is uh, one project. Okay, jo pardon me, just to be clear, because we're, there. we're totally out of time, but um, this project Already. that you talk about, uh, has it begun? What phase are you basically training welders, right? But has it begun? It's, what phase are it's you? It's out there. We've advertised. Okay, so you've not started a training. It's out. No, I'm saying, have you begun the training? Is what I'm saying. We have no. We haven't got. We haven't begun the training. All right. We want to take Nigerians fairly, and we have given the opportunity. It's online registration now, right. and it will surprise you to know that as we speak, over forty-eight thousand Nigerians have registered, have registered okay. for this program 
that uh, we, we just have spaces for 700. Okay. And that um, speaks to the issues. We are trying to accommodate as, as many much as, as we possible. Can. We and really intend to go back to council to, to plead for more uh, spaces so that we do some more. And that is just one. You know, you asked for two, and I promise I was going to give you well, three. Honorable Minister, if we go at this rate, we'll probably, I know you can say a lot of what you're doing, but we'll probably end the show by no, no, 10. No, no, it's not about but we're totally out of tangibles. time. So this is what we'll and do. Things you can verify. I, I understand. This is what we'll do, Honorable Minister. We'll have this conversation another time. We wish we had a lot of time uh, on this conversation, but, but of course. But uh, you're, you're, not being fair, you're not being fair on us. Well, Honorable Minister, for full disclosure, issues, this conversation was meant to and then you say we are running out of time. Well, this conversation, as you know, was meant to start for 8 a.m., but it didn't start until you arrived. So we had planned to have a longer conversation, but again, we're constrained by so time. So let me just take a minute but we have to, round to We have to anchor. Uh, maybe you can take 30 seconds to speak to a second thing you're doing, then we'll at least would we'll anchor. Well, immediately, immediately after there's a boot camp program, I told you about the Vessel to Greenhouse Initiative. We intend to recover in partnership with four uh, indigenous steel manufacturing companies to recover 3,000 abandoned vehicles that are uh, within Nigeria's territorial waters from Lagos to Baelsa. We partner with them, we break the ships down to scrap and we convert them to greenhouses. And when we, we produce this, we, ha we are targeting the 100,000 pieces for the pilot. We locate them in clusters around city centers so as to save our people from being kidnapped from the bushes and the farms in the hinterland. And we locate them in the six geographical zones of the country. We want to bring on board the youth population. They will they do the same thing, they register online. We attach every one young person to one greenhouse to produce a crop of his choice. Green, uh, sweet corns, veggies, whatever, ornamental plants for export. Everything you want to produce, All right. we train you, we give you one greenhouse and you start up on your own. You imagine how that can be replicated around the country. The first pilot I said is our 100,000. Right. By the time you start Honorable Minister, you would agree that I have been more than fair enough. Going to Europe and All earning right. dollars. Okay. But we have to run now. You so this is what we'll do. That, that will do a lot <laughs> by way of contribution to food security. All right. So we'll have this conversation. Uh, we'll continue this conversation in the coming days. And I must commend you uh, for at least uh, showing up to have this conversation. Wish we had more time. But the Honorable Minister of State for Steel Development, Mr. Obama Gary, thank you for your time. I know Nigerians will be looking to see how this ties to economic development. But thank you so much and look forward to speaking with you yet again. For us, you will see some more. All righty. Oh, there you have it. We'll take a moment down. When we return, we'll turn our attention to our super eagles. They're not being treated well at all in Libya. And we'll get right into it in a few seconds. Yes, we're behind our super eagles. So stay with us right here on the morning break. Welcome back. And so now we turn our attention to sports as we look at the state of things as far as the Afghan qualifiers are concerned. Our, co our colleague and correspondent sports, Cecilia Omorogwe, joins us now on the program. It's good to see you again, Cecilia. How are you doing? It's great to be here. Yeah. We're not really happy money. We're supposed to have a happy money, right? You're not looking like what the Super Eagles are going through. Yeah. No, um, no, no. Uh, what, what the expression looks like it. You know, you, Cecilia would have been smiling yeah, if we're no, talking about the... Match that Nigeria won, but it looks like things are different. So, yeah. what's the state of things with the Super Eagles? I, 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 okay, right now, I mean, oh, I saw in the tweet by the captain William Trist Ekong saying, uh, from after waiting for 12 hours, that obviously they may just boycott, boycott the game. So, that's what is happening now. And I think I will support that. Okay, let, let me give it, let, let's try to paint a picture Thank you very of what much. actually happened. Okay, right, okay, now. The Super Eagles of Nigeria traveled yesterday to Libya, you know, for the game, return leg. They won the first leg in Oyo. And uh, before the game, the Libyans were complaining that the way they were received in Nigeria, they didn't like it. And the NFF came out to say that, look, 
it was misinformation. They were supposed to have landed in New York straight up, but they went to they landed in Port Harcourt, mm. and they didn't send information on time. At mm. the time, the NFL received it was three hours delay, so they had to send the bus, but they refused to enter. You know the bus that NFL sent. They used their small small buses to convey themselves to you. So uh, I, I think they're trying to do a payback time, but this is is worse. Sorry, than sorry. who's okay. trying to do a payback? The Libyans, because according to them, they were mistreated in Nigeria. That's according to them. But NFM released a statement saying that that wasn't true. Because you were supposed to have landed straight into you. And of course, ar or you, you arrange for a delegation that will receive them, then take them to the airport, you know, make them welcome and everything. But instead of that, they landed in Port Harcourt. And then the NFM didn't know. At the time, they were told, so like, they wasted like three hours. There's a, there's a particular picture circulating that they were Olympian players. But if you take a look at that picture very well, you know that they don't even look like the players who played on the field on Friday. That's a picture circulating when they were seated at the airport waiting. But even if they had waited, it was like three hours, you know. But right now, it's been 13 hours, according to the captain of the team, William Trostekon, a series of tweets. We can actually see the tweets right now. You, you read through the tweet and see that it's... It's not, it's, it's really, really sad. And uh, Victor Boniface also, you know, uh, had some tweets. Okay, you, you can see it right there, uh, Coyote, you yeah. know, when he said uh, 12, hour, 12 hours in an abandoned airport in Libya after a plane was diverted while descending. Libya government rescinded approval, landing in Benghazi with no reason. And they've locked the airport gate and left us without phone connection, food or drink, all to play mind games. Come on. I mean, Come it, on. I mean this, this is not looking good at all. He said he, he, they actually expected stuff before. They actually expected something. They've experienced something like this, you know, while playing in Africa. But this is really disgraceful because this, this is not what you expect to happen. I'm trying to find a way to actually express my anger right now. Is that even the Tunisian pilots who thankfully managed to navigate the last minute change to an airport not fit for a plane to land, but never seen something like this before. So they went to a smaller airport to land, which is not supposed to be. And after that, upon arrival, uh, they, they couldn't even find a nearby airport to rest with the, they couldn't find a, a airport to rest, no hotel to rest, nowhere. They could not even sleep. So right now, they want to just boycott the game and come back home. I so mean, because what, what's the other option, right? They, if they're not allowing them in, no. there's no point, right? And that's why they said they've actually called for Nigerian government to intervene and rescue them from that. As a captain, together with the team, we've decided that we will not play this game. CAF should look at the reports and what is happening here. Even if they decide to allow them to play the game, they may not this can allow this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Let them have the point. We will not accept to travel anywhere by road here. Even with security, it is not safe. We can only imagine what the hotel or food would be like giving to us if we continue. Now, since if we would look at the genesis of this yeah. uh, uh, challenge, yeah. which was when they came to Nigeria yes. and um, they were stranded at the airport. They, they were refused, not really stranded. They refused to yeah, board accept, the bus that yeah. was provided. Yeah, and they used and the their own. NFF provided yeah. a statement to yeah. say that you know, um, it was due to misinformation. Mm. Um, is that misinformation pardonable? Did somebody drop the ball It, it, it wasn't like, like they, they didn't tell them. We know how the North Africans work. This is not the first time. It happens on the continent. When Sometimes when club, clubs, Ayuma has experienced a lot, a lot of it. Rivers United too also, they've experienced uh, something like this. That when they're traveling, like, they just let them be. Like, they, don't, they, they just let them be. Sometimes they don't even, you know, provide the necessary uh, reception for them. We know we Nigerians, we are very receptible people. We know that. And we, we even welcome foreigners more Sometimes than more. ourselves. <laughs> yes, more. Yeah, yeah. We, we know how we behave. We welcome foreigners more than ourselves. Because I follow, we follow teams. We see how, we, re, we know how we receive our own teams when they're here. What happened to them wasn't Nigerian Football Federation's fault. It was their own fault. If they had told, they were not supposed to go to Port Harcourt. They were supposed to go to you. Why land in Port Harcourt? Where were you expected to land? in New York to start with. So you landed in New York. They didn't get the information three hours later. So who, 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 what happened then? So e even if that had happened, fine. But theirs was three hours, right? Fine. So what happened here? They multiplied three by four. That's, that's the thing. Least. So you don't do that. So, and they're still there. So this looks like deliberate payback. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. It, it, this is not even payback. This is 
we should we use the word evil or something it's, because, it just seems, because uh, it's, it's more than three uh, the traveling like the traveling by road right. is more than three hours to where they will go to eventually eventually now if they experience this now as truth said where would they put them mm. where would they only, put them only, so, this so much is for it's uh, tomorrow. It's for tomorrow. tomorrow. So, so the our options... players haven't slept. Right. They they haven't rested. They're supposed to train this evening for that game. You know, have a, a, a light training. And once they land, usually they go to the straight to the airport. Have a light training. Just you know, like walk around the airport to so stretch themselves and everything. In the evening they have a light training session, and in the morning they just walk around. You know, the morning walk before the game in the evening. So let me paint a, uh, yeah. another picture, or like, like let me buttress the point. Nigeria is at the top of the group. Yes. Libya is bottom. at the bottom. A point from three matches. From three matches. Yes. Nigeria won the last match. Yes. Right, one nil. Yeah. Okay. And they packed the bus. <laughs> even though yeah. they packed the bus. Even though they packed the bus, We yeah. still won the match. Nine now, defenders. Now, I, I'm trying to look at this at least dispassionately. Yeah. I'm always for the super egos, right? Yeah. But I want to look at this dispassionately. You've yeah. explained what happened on the Nigerian yeah. side, right? Yeah. And hey... What does Nigeria have to really gain or lose from this in any way if we really... I mean, Nigeria has a good team, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure that we want to delay them or anything yeah. just so that we can have an yeah. edge over them. I think Nigeria always wins that fair play award. We are mm -hmm. one of the teams that is always fair when yes. they play on the mm -hmm. field. So I've tried to explain that. Now to what they are doing. Now this has happened. They've delayed our players. I imagine how the players feel because yeah. mm -hmm. football is a performance game. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your mind, your body has to be the very best for you to perform. What are the options available? I know he has said that my for, um, give them the point. It's point. But, so CAF has a major role to play. Yeah. NFF has a major role to play. Yeah. Even the Nigerian government at large diplomatically has a major role to play. So yeah. what are the options available now? Has this happened before? What were the options then? Yeah, I, 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 I've been, that's what I've been thinking, trying to do a, a, a research to see. I, I don't, I, I, I haven't seen it before. I haven't. Wow. I haven't seen this, this, this much, situation yeah. much. Yes, it's mm. not this terrible. But I know that when a team refused to play a match, CAF will just award the points to mm. the home team since the others refuse to play. That's usually uh, that's usually the clear point. If they refuse, but, but yes, not if, if they, they are. This is like a force majeure. That's, that's what uh, precisely they've Kaffu been forced award, to award pull a point out. To so, so CAF, CAF will award it to the home team if the team come in and saying they refuse to play. But CAF will need to investigate this mm. and see if they can justify the reasons why the super egos are refusing to play is enough for them to just nullify the whole match and then maybe reschedule the game mm. or give the three points to libya but i think from what i know about Kaf, <laughs> well, well, <laughs> this may probably probably uh, they may just give the three points you know what, what i want to say right libya. they may just give the three points to to, to libya they may feel this why? may it may not be i, I don't I, I really don't know. But I think from what would... I mean, when teams refuse to play, the usual thing is you give it to the home team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's what they're trying to do. Frustrate the Super Eagles so much and then they will get angry and go back. They will not write to CAF that mm -hmm. the team did not come and the referee will perform the usual match... Um, I want the, I'm trying to remember it now. Usual, you know, the match formalities. And after that, they declare, okay, three points goes to that's the diabolical. home team. That's well, yes, that's, that's usually what happens. But, but if you, if you, I mean, just look at these players now. I, I mean, they were at the airport for a very, very long time. And I was going to say that that's uh, no evidence food, abounds. No water, no phones, to... no communication, yeah. nothing. So and it's are, terrible. Those are the bits and pieces of evidence, you know, that yeah. should justify why the Eagles are saying that they're not going to play. Yeah. But, you know, CC, I'm more concerned about what could have been done to prevent this from everything that you have said it appears as if we know the character of the libyans yeah we, we uh, speaking speaking of which yeah it because it's it's, it's seeming like it's becoming a a, a, a diplomatic situation now mm -hmm. Do you, don't you think that the nff ought to have done something you know to prevent you know matters from degenerating to this level how <laughs> i'm going to trade back at you because i mean you're traveling to another country for a game Usually, a delegation will be there to welcome you and take you to your hotel and make you comfortable. That's what it's done. That's the usual thing that is being done everywhere across the world. Now, what could they have done differently? They were traveling with a value jet, with a you know, charter flight. So they needed to provide a, play, I mean, a clearance for them to land. And then they couldn't land where they were supposed to land. They took them to a smaller airport. Who does that? Let's start from there. What could they have done differently? 
So maybe what we uh, what truth uh, according did to the truth after of after what uh, happened in Nigeria, did you we, anticipate that this would happen? What happened in Nigeria wasn't something. It wasn't big. It wasn't like it was just misinformation. It wasn't. I don't know how to put it. Like you, you were supposed to. They ask you. This is where we're giving you clearance, and you went somewhere else. Who do you blame? You went somewhere else. At the time you make your communication known, it was, okay, they responded three hours later. But who, see, see. Where would they blame? Go? And they even come out and they apologize for that. But if, for instance, Nigeria had, they landed in that, another uh, uh, airport, for instance, and then they still come and take them. But this is not making sense. Sissy. Uh, we Which? are behind our super eagles. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure, and I'm talking about the NFF, the Nigerian authorities, Libyan authorities yeah. need to ensure that the right thing is done. If the players don't feel safe, by all means, they should come back home where they feel safe, okay? And then we'll take it up from there. But CAF needs to look at this dispassionately and ensure that this is not encouraged. Because other teams will just say, oh, fine, this is a mm -hmm. game plan. We're going to frustrate any team that is coming. Yeah. Frustrate them. 20 hours, keep them mm -hmm. at the airport so that we can get a walkover and get the three points. So, we have to anchor at this point, but clearly, I know you are keeping a watch of this. I know you are speaking with the team as well. So stay with us right here on Channels Television. But Sissy, it's not a happy day. Yeah. You don't look the part, as I said. You look very good. So I really hope Nigerians will look at you and, Certainly and get some joy. It's not a typical sports segment with Sissy. Yeah, I that, wish we were talking about something more joyous the, about yeah, the performance the of the Do you understand? That's yeah. what we're planning. And then yeah. this morning, the story started trickling in. I thought by now, by the time the show starts, mm. we'll, you know, we'll know everything would have been settled. Okay. But right now, I think I will support me. I will support a boycott, really. Right. They should mm -hmm. just teach North Africans lesson. They shouldn't play this game. All Thank right. you so much, Sissy, yeah. uh, for this. Sissy Lamorbe. I know you are following this, so we'll get back to you uh, as soon as you have more. But thank you. Have a great day. Yes. Great indeed. Day. Speaking of which, stay, stick with our sports segment for updates on this. Of course, we'll be bringing you all of the updates that you require. And we hope that, you know, things play, play out well. But more importantly, that our Super Eagles are safe, whatever happens. Thank you so much for watching the program today. It's just the start of the week. We have so much lined up for you throughout the week. So join us on the Morning Brief on Channels Television. I am Bukola Koga. And I'm Karido Kikulu. Sunrise Daily is next, and I can tell you it is going to be a package. Good morning.